Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, and welcome to our Kubernetes panel event. Um, so I guess a little bit of background um, on this. Uh, I was lucky enough to give a presentation on Kubernetes for Java developers back in uh, November, December. Uh, and it was really intended as kind of a, an introduction to, uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, the stuff that I learned over the last few years, you know, what is Kubernetes? Where does it come from? How does it relate to Docker? Uh, what are the various pieces? Um, it was really kind of like a, in a beginner's look. Um, we had a lot of really good feedback from that. And we had a, quite a few requests from the community for like a follow-up event. So this is that follow-up event. Uh, we are extremely fortunate that we have an extremely uh, illustrious panel uh, joining us today. Uh, so they're gonna be sharing their wisdom. I am honored um, to be part of this. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, asking the, the questions. Um, kind of the plan for the session is going to be that uh, we'll have a, a few questions that we've pre-selected. Um, we'll discuss that across the panel and then about halfway through, we'll open it up um, to questions from the audience. Um, so quick intro for me, um, I'm Rob. Um, a few years back, I was hosting the Docklands London Java community events, uh, kind of in the years before COVID. Um, I think Daniel, you came to present a couple of times with us. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, over the last, uh, I guess, 12 years, I've been working in banking. Um, so working with uh, some of the large banks in the, in the Docklands area. Um, largely working with like on-premise stuff, but also virtual and also getting uh, involved with Kubernetes, particularly around OpenShift. Um, I have some experience of running stuff at scale, um, but not quite the, the same level as you guys, uh, which is why we're here. And uh, so let's kick it off, right? So let's go around the room um, and can everyone please introduce yourselves and uh, give a quick uh, intro and tell us how you got involved in Kubernetes. So Daniel, you're on my screen, so I'm gonna pick on you first. Sure thing. Hello everyone, Daniel Bryant, uh, currently working in DevRel at Ambassador Labs, but background is very much Java development, uh, software architecture, reluctant operator, I like to say. I cut my teeth on, on Docker when it, before it was cool, then did Tutum, if you remember Tutum or Tatum, I think it was, in the cloud, Docker Swarm, then did Mesos, and then did um, Kubernetes. So um, yes, run it in production, uh, it'd be like, well, just after one zero, I think it was, um, made a bunch of mistakes, um, had a few successes, so I'm here to share some of those learnings tonight. Fantastic. Um, Edson. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you very much for the invite. I would lo have loved to be in person in London for this meeting, but unfortunately, that's the next best thing. Uh, I'm a Japanese-Brazilian Japanese that currently lives in the US, uh, North Carolina, more specifically. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP. And currently, I lead the, the developer advocacy team at Red Hat. Awesome. Thanks, Edson. Um, Nick. Hi, thanks. Yeah, so I'm Nick Ebbett. Um, so I'm a, I'm a software developer for the strong interest in ops and, uh, you know, interest in application delivery. Um, I'm also the organizer, organizer of the Manchester Joe. Um, I, my, my kind of Kubernetes experience kind of comes from joining the company called Auto Trader UK um, around four years ago. At the time, they were fully on-premises, private cloud organization. And they took a strategic decision around three years ago to move to GCP and Google uh, Kubernetes engine. So I've been involved in that journey of taking, um, like moving the organization from private cloud to public cloud and adopting Kubernetes along the way. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. Um, Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna from Romania. Um, and um, also was recently announced as a Java champion and working as an architect in my day to day job. I started and still in Java at core, but I also like to entangle the mysteries of Kubernetes. Um, and how did I get into this? Well, I was curious in the beginning and then well, people learned that I was curious and things got more serious than that. So uh, that's uh, a little bit of why I'm here today. And I hope that my lessons learned will help you as well. Awesome, thank you, Anna. And Duncan. Good evening. Uh, my name is Duncan Lowy, and I'm the non-Java person in the room. So all the um, brick bats and banana skins can get thrown at me. Um, my my background is more around infrastructure, enterprise architecture, DevOps, those kind of spaces. 
And so my view of Kubernetes has mostly come from uh, once upon a time being someone who went into server rooms and how we've actually gone from that physical world to a more and more virtual and how we handle these things as they as, and until the point, until we get to the point where we actually just have five computers in the world uh, and they are running billions of Kubernetes jobs. Awesome, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. And so that's the intros out of the way. Um, so I think I'll pick one of the questions. Um, what do you wish you knew when you started out? So this is to the panel in general. So uh, anyone shout out if they have an answer. What do you wish you knew? I think um, from my perspective, um, I wish I'd known how much YAML I'd have to deal with every day. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so we, we you know, Kubernetes, is, you know, at its kind of rawest form is a lot of YAML. We also use Helm as a, a, pa like a package management and helping to deploy our applications. And that gets interesting because um, Helm has a templating language. So you end up with like code within YAML. And yeah, it's it's interesting and not much fun at times. So I wish I'd known that. I might have avoided it. I, I have a my more personal view on this one. Uh, I wish I'd known how complicated our work is working with uh, Kubernetes policies and how many are there available. And yeah, well, actually the network policies are something like, like an Achilles point for me, an Achilles heel for me. So yeah, that's what I wanted to know in the beginning because in the beginning I thought, hey, it's all deployments and services, not. <laughs> For my um, thing, I definitely say the mental models will alter for the developer workflow. And shameless plug, I did a talk for this Gotopia last week, these slides from my slide share, where I talked about Scaffold, Telepresence, and Argo CD as some tools, specific tools. But I really struggled for a while when I had microservices running in the cloud, like in GKE, like, like, like Nick, I use GKE quite a lot. And I want to develop on one of those services, but I want to get that fast feedback loop going on. I'm used to my Spring Boot monolith, right? On my Spring monolith, I got hot reload. I missed that when everything got fragmented into microservices and I couldn't physically run them all on my local machine. So things like Scaffold for the automating a fast dev loop um, is, is sort of build, rebuilding in the background is really cool. It's an open source Google tool. And Telepresence, I actually have worked on that. So own my bias there. But Telepresence CNCF tool that puts your laptop in the cluster effectively. So you get very fast feedback loop. It's you share the network namespace of the Kubernetes cluster so you can curl the services as if you're there. And once I discovered those kind of tools, um, it made my life as a developer so much easier. Excellent. Um, anyone else or shall we move on to another question? Yeah, I'd like to point that the first time I saw a YAML file was when I started touching Kubernetes. And I was like, uh, I don't understand what is happening with this format that makes them make, make me miss like XML so much. I still miss it. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, I touched Kubernetes before uh, joining Red Hat. That was back in 2016. So I knew how to run a bit around Kubernetes. But the first thing I did at Red Hat, I just dropped into a meeting, a product management meeting discussing Kubernetes and OpenShift. And then suddenly I had this ton of concepts that I'd never heard about. And we were discussing product direction or how this feature new. So then I just realized how deep or how wide is the amount of knowledge that you need to learn, like to, to know really what's happening behind the scenes inside Kubernetes. So I wish I'd, I had learned this concept before having to like having these deep discussions uh, regarding Kubernetes. So uh, yeah, that would have helped uh, a lot my experience regarding Kubernetes. But on the other hand, uh, I don't see why I would be learning this if I didn't have to touch Kubernetes. So that that's the po two point, different points of view. Very cool, thank you. I would, and I would say that mine slightly overlaps with that because I think we spent far too much time worrying about Kubernetes versus Docker Swarm and OpenShift versus OpenShift Origin and trying to decide about what frameworks and tools we're going to use when that, in a sense, that doesn't really matter because Kubernetes is Kubernetes and it does the same thing in all these places. Um, I mean, you are eventually going to get to the corners, but you're going to get a long way down the road before you actually have to worry about the difference between GKE and, and AKE and whatever the other AWSK. 
Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, uh, so let's talk more about uh, from a Java developer perspective. So, what do you think the difficulties are for a Java developer picking up Kubernetes for the first time, as opposed to, I, I don't know, Python or uh, or Ruby or Go? I'd say the obvious one, which we've already covered, Robert, is, is sort of the mental models. So, but that's mm -hmm. somewhat language independent, like if you can still struggle with Python. One of the biggest things with Java or .NET, um, when you have the JVM or CLR in the mix, is the resource requirements. So I've had my pods oom killed all the time <laughs> when I've been running Java, because Java, like, we love it, right? But unless you're running Graal or something, you're going to need a minimum, like, 250 um, meg uh, memory allowance on, on the on the pod, um, on the on the actual um, container pod. Um, so I I'm, uh, I had this actually even in Mesos pre Kubernetes. Um, we were running sort of like small Go services, absolutely fine. But as soon as we spun up a small Java service, we bumped into all kinds of you know, memory constraints, these kind of things. So there's lots of people I blogged about it a bit, but I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, as many other people. Names are escaping me who I learned many things from. Um, and just as a little hat tip to, uh, or a little mention, I should say, if you're running like Java 8 pre-153 or some, some update number, it is not Docker aware, not container aware, I should say. So I bumped into all manner of problems where the JVM is doing weird stuff. Well, I thought it was doing weird stuff and it was actually connected to the fact it was running in a container, whereas Java really in the JVM was built for running on you know, big servers 20 years ago or whatever. It's got a lot better after what uh, Java 8 update whatever it was. But um, just an FYI, many of us are stuck running old JVMs, right? I work with folks who are running still J uh, Java 4, Java 5, and be aware your JVM does not respect some of the Docker constraints correctly. Yeah, I think I can agree with that as well. From my experience, seeing you know, migrating applications from VM-based kind of operating systems to containers, it's almost, you know, and as a developer, you maybe in the past you didn't really think about the VM. I think the container becomes much closer to you in terms of your development life cycle. You, you start to think less about your distributable artifact being a jar file and it's now a Docker image. And what does that mean for my app? You know, can I run that locally in a, a similar way to it running in production? Um, and that can be a bit of a hurdle at first, you know, becoming familiar with this, this new tech stack essentially of, with Docker in the mix. Yeah, we oh. had some. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, no, please. Oh, we had some changes in the process on uh, on how do we think about our Java application. First, we had this long, very long running processes, application servers. Then we had like uh, executable jar files with like uh, Spring Boot um, and this kind of things. And then the first challenge was, as Daniel pointed out, we had to containerize our applications. And then uh, we started running these containerized applications in a single host. So even though it was a container, we still had a machine, we would restart the container and keep it running. And when we moved to Kubernetes, we added another challenge is that now our applications to be able to run successfully inside Kubernetes, they need to be stateless. So we need to externalize the internal state of applications somewhere else so they can survive because there's no guarantee that your container will be running or will keep running uh, inside the same host. So uh, I think th these were the, the main steps in the ladder that we needed to go through to be able to, su to succeed uh, being Java developers in Kubernetes. I think it's um, one of the big steps when you're coming from the background of monoliths or you're used to have an application server that runs everything and is you know building your context for your app is the that separation of uh, concerns i mean what is still the concern of your app and what should be externalized and it's something that uh, daniel also touched and um and also nick um because we are really trying to make a mental model of what how is how are things going to happen on our local and then how things are going to happen for the rest of the world um and that's one of the biggest challenges in the beginning um, and I can say that maybe in every beginning, how you make your development process, because let's face it, not all the machines nowadays, I do know that developers should work with the best in class laptops or whatever you name it. But uh, sometimes they're not all the laptops are fit to run all the tools that we would need like to build everything in our machines. This is why we don't have Kubernetes uh, clusters on our machines most of the time and we run it somewhere else. 
So those being said, um, you know, establishing a development process clear for, for yourself, but also for the rest of, of, the, of the team members is, is another challenge with, with Kubernetes when you are starting with it or actually when you're becoming really acquainted with it um, is, is another ending story. And another story, and as, as, uh, as Daniel mentioned, I think troubleshooting. The idea of how can you, um, you know, troubleshoot something that happens not on your machine and happens somewhere else, and maybe you don't have all the time the rights to be there a hundred percent as an administrator or to control everything. So, you know, giving up control—that's uh, that's something that developers had to learn, and I had to learn as a developer, like giving up control. That not everything that I do as a developer, my application as a Java app developer, is in my control. Uh, awesome, thanks, guys. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's jump on. Um, so, what tips do you have for people running production clusters at scale? So what does scale mean for you, um, and how do we get there? So I start off with so the customers I work with at Ambassador Labs. Some of them are running like crazy numbers. Some of the gaming companies we work with, I can't mention names, but they're running like, you know, crazy size machines and crazy size clusters. And I think it often, it's sort of almost Kubernetes um, agnostic, but you have to have good visibility, observability, as we're all calling it now. Um, you know, Prometheus is used a lot in the Kubernetes space and um, plugging it up to um, Grafana, Kibana for your logs, things like that. Um, you definitely want to be able to understand what's going on where. Combination of some cloud vendor tools, your own tools as well. And um, there's some great things like um, Lens, Octant, there's, there's tools out there, open source tools to sort of help you understand as well. But I think the, the folks I see running these big clusters, they're really they typically they've, they've got really good at observing and doing fault detection. So distributed tracing, Zipkin, Jaeger, Lightstep, take your pick there. Um, they, they can, you know, if problems happening, they're well aware of it and they can zoom in uh, using all the, the tools they've got available. So at scale, you have to be able to fault find quickly. Yeah, I think um, like at our chain, we, our scale is essentially we've got 400 services running on in a cluster in production and um, to enable that to be even manageable we've had to think about what is that layer of abstraction that we expose to our developers what services do they need to be affected what platform capabilities we allow them to debug their apps and yeah like I said some of these things uh, you know open source products but some of, a lot of it to be honest is kind of unique to our organization their tools and capabilities that we've had to build that fit our workflows. Um, a really good example of this, especially that became um, really important when we had the first lockdown last year was that we realized that our incident management process had kind of traditionally been everyone get together, let's solve this problem. And now actually we're all distributed and remote and that became really difficult. So we built tooling to help with that and that involves Slack and workflows and enabled us to really collaborate on you know, incident management as a specific problem in an effective way that met the, the requirements. And I suppose it's that constraint of the remote nature kind of forced that capability to emerge in our organization. I would say that um, when you're at scale, you have to be really keeping an eye on the releases of Kubernetes and what's in them and how the API evolves. Uh, it's surprising, but you know, the API evolves. <laughs> And, and some, uh, some objects uh, have different, uh, different versions and, and um, they get promoted from, I'd say, beta state or alpha state to a full, uh, full version. Um, so I would say that is very important when you're, when you're uh, running it in production. And also, um, I know it sounds uh, like, okay, we've done this with everything probably, uh, but backing up and restoring um, and I'm not talking about backing up and restoring the hard way here, but backing up and restoring in general, like how are you managing backup and restore? Um, that's another thing that you should always keep up to date because new practices are coming around about that uh, for your provider, for your, I don't know, you're running on premise, uh, your own uh, clusters and you're managing that. Um, so that's something that uh, I would recommend, like stay up to date with the releases, what's happening in the releases. I mean, read the release notes, what's going on there. Don't go and update just because it's new. Um, and of course, uh, stay up to date with the best practices and what people are saying. And yeah, that's at least that's my advice for, for keeping a good production scale. 
Yeah, my advice is related to any scale, not just a large scale. Uh, but when you're small, I think it's easier for you to think that, well, maybe I'll get just vanilla Kubernetes and start using. But then when you do, then you just realize that, oh, I need pipelines. I need registry. I need these. I need that. And when you have a small scale, it's kind of easier for you to overlook this stuff. Well, it's kind of working. But when you have a large scale, then you, 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 you start to get like bigger problems. So my advice is that pick a, a, a Kubernetes distribution. There is always a distribution, even if you're baking one yourself. And when you do bake one yourself, you might be thinking, well, maybe Kubernetes is my core business. Maybe I have different requirements from everybody else which uh, it's possible, but very, very, very unlikely. So if you want to use Kubernetes at scale, pick a distribution. It doesn't matter if it's AKS, EKS, GKS, or OpenShift or anything else. Just pick one and use the features that the distribution gives to you. Like anything that is managed, somebody's patching it, somebody's adding new features, somebody's thinking about this stuff that is important only to the distribution. So you can focus on the on the very specific subject of keeping my applications running into production. Yeah, I think that, that's a, a very good point. Like we use uh, GKE and that allows us to offload that concern around operating Kubernetes to some experts at Google, which which is great for us. And yeah, you can we can focus our energy and our time on building on top of that and creating some real value for the business. And I would probably end up talking a little bit, uh, you know, I think it's the kind of understanding, understanding your architecture, what are your processes, what are your data flows? Uh, you know, Daniel's already talked about um, observability. And, you know, as far as possible, you want to make sure that you're using the tools that are available to show you what's happening. But you probably, but you also need to make, and maybe it goes back to the mental model thing, um, but it's, it's the more general model of, of you know, domain-driven design, understanding what the flows are through that system so that, um, you know, again, when you need to troubleshoot or when you need to change things, merge or separate services, you understand what is actually happening there without getting lost in the detail or, or putting yourself in a position where you don't actually um, understand, you know, you don't recognize why things are happening. And so that just, just making sure that you've got a common, common team model of what the, what the services are doing, how they all fit together, all those kind of things, which is, you know, it's not Java specific, but if you're, if you're, it is quite easy to trip things up and make life very difficult for yourself or your team if you don't have those things in, in a team understanding, a common understanding. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so a reminder to everyone who's, who's joined us, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we're gonna open it up to the audience in a second or two. Uh, so get those questions coming in. Um, but I want to touch on, I, I guess, a few points that people have raised. Um, so can we talk about like, governance, DevOps, things like vulnerability management and security? So how do we manage that in a Kubernetes world? I think the first option is to pay somebody to do that to you, for, for you, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you have a distribution, is the responsibility of the provider to do that for you. And so that's part of the answer. The other is, I think that for the vulnerability scanning, like you have a lot of dependencies. If you're using NPM, for example, you should be doing that very frequently. Uh, it should be probably part of your pipeline. So there are tools available to developers. You can add this pl these plugins in your pipeline. So every time you're creating a build, you can uh, detect if you have any security issues uh, on top of that. And there are some services available as well. They do the vulnerability scanning on your dependencies. And if it's integrated in your pipeline, whenever they discover a security issue, they can automatically trigger a new build in your deployment pipeline so it can be fixed automatically in production. So these are some of the strategies that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, connect, kind of connected to that is, is not letting containers lie, you know, live for too long. Um, you know, keep using that kind of Kubernetes advantage that it will respawn, it will restart. So you don't, you don't want to have very long lived objects. I mean, it's almost taking it back to the days when we used to reboot our service every Sunday night, perhaps. Um, but it's just the same. It is the same. It is a, 
the modernization of that idea. So you are picking up the latest fields. You're not having something that has got a vulnerability that's sitting there running in production um, for any significant amount of time. Yeah, I, I mean, I love to know. I'll show that we have like a curated kind of set of base Docker images that people build from. And we keep those up to date, you know, pretty you know, frequently, maybe every week or so. We will make sure they're rebuilt and got the latest security patches. Um, from an application developer's perspective, though, we, um, we then alert based on the age of an application the last time it was deployed. And if that gets above a certain threshold, they get notified about that. We, we've, we've kind of put toyed with the idea of being a bit more forceful around that, um, but we haven't gone there yet. But it's all moving in the right direction. It's all thinking about that kind of security profile and the application health, essentially. I'll just check in something you said there, Nick, made me think. So folks haven't bumped into buildpacks.io. Buildpacks.io, it's a CNCF project. Um, it's a really nice way to sort of get rid of some of the, the security uh, issues, so to speak, in terms of like Heroku have got fantastic build packs, kind of ironic, right? Heroku, the business model around doing PaaS. Now they give this stuff away for free, but they've got fantastic build packs for Java, Go, Python. They regularly update them. So you can put it in your, um, your build pipeline. So I regularly use scaffold with buildpacks.io. Um, and you, it's even got some cool like sort of Java aware, so you can explode your jar file and just drop in um, class files from the lo coding locally, say, and it, uploads just the class files drops into the build pack and um, so build packs are a great way to um not build your own docker images basically so i see some folks to your point nick earlier on like a big jump for me moving from java developer to kubernetes or docker user was i was suddenly exposed to operating systems ports file systems user privileges and that was a massive learning curve and, and luckily i had some fantastic ops folks that brought me along on the journey but um these days um maybe don't need some of that in terms of there is best practices out there like using build packs. Um, but then to Edson's point, I'm always a fan of paying money where someone will clearly add value. So, you know, security consultants are always well worth the money. And then I'm happy to pay like folks like Aqua, Sneak, like, you know, Red Hat, take your pick. I've got no affiliation with these folks, but I, I've got a lot of value uh, in paying for something, something that's important to us as security it only takes one incident to kind of ruin your business potentially. So I think in addition to getting the best practices in there, paying some cash to, to like for folks to sort of take that responsibility away from you or, or at least mitigate some of the risks associated with what you're doing as well is money well spent. Thanks guys. Uh, so we've got some great questions coming through. Let's let me pick a few here. So are you finding that teams are more actively discussing alternative Java frameworks potentially lighter ones, instead of the standard spring IOC dependency injections approaches after their maturity with containerization grows? Mm, I think here it depends on the team. Uh, the reason being is because folks have started probably with containerization, let's say with, because we're mentioning spring here, like spring boot one and one dot something. Um, and they're fine with the microservices, they reach the maturity of the system, like it's live in production and it's happening or some, this kind of approach. I mean, if you are staying on one and then just, you are looking into the world and say, hey, but I'm, it's a little bit tougher for me, uh, then probably yes, you will look to alternative Java frameworks. But if you started with a framework, you should continue with that framework. And in the frameworks that are nowadays supporting the microservices architecture and also everything around building things and deploying them in Kubernetes, um, these frameworks evolve. So you should be following the evolution of your framework because most probably is doing something good for, your, uh, for you and you should invest time into you know, growing your skills with that and improving your architecture and what you already built not just go from, from scratch again and redo it or migrate everything to a newer framework because it seems lighter. Yeah, I think that anything running into production for six months or more uh, should be called legacy. Not because it's old, but it's successful. It's running into production for six months anyway. And it's very likely that it's going to keep running for even more. Uh, if the business requirements and the environment, like you're not demanded to change that thing running into production. Uh, if it doesn't add any value, why would it change just for the sake of changing? So you should keep it. But if you're forced to change just because 
well, the scale is much higher, or I think because I'm having to scale much more like instances, now I have like a tens uh, of instances running, and because the memory consumption is too high, well, maybe uh, maybe that's an opportunity for you to be taking a look at other frameworks. And I know that I have to talk about that because it's one of my favorite subjects, but are there new Java frameworks that allows you to have like smaller memory footprint and then like a faster uh, startup time? So if these are the problems that you're trying to solve, then maybe you should try to be looking at other frameworks. For On the other hand, if you don't have this kind of issue, uh, it's a good thing for you to reuse or your existing skills. Uh, so not changing just for the sake of changing, but applying your, your trade-off. But if you have these requirements to change, I have to point out, uh, I think the most like known frameworks for these are Quarkus and uh, Micronaut. And I'll have to point out that my favorite one is Quarkus, but you might wonder why. <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, that's that's my advice. If you if you have this change and you have these requirements to change, then take a look. Or else, I think I would stick with the technology that I was using before. Yeah, I think um, we can even take it another level. Personally, that with containerization, it just brings us more flexibility, and we don't even I know this is a Java community event. But we don't have to stay within the Java kind of ecosystem necessarily. If you like, we. You can move into Kubernetes has made it much easier to enable our data scientists to deploy their Python workloads. Um, and there's not much difference to how we deploy our Java workloads, really. There's, it's kind of from a platform perspective, we can support that really easily. So, yeah, I think right kind of tool for the job is probably um, a good way to think of it. But also, yeah, um, I think as an organization or as developers, you do have familiarity, familiarity with certain tech stacks and just jumping from one to another doesn't make a lot of kind of sense necessarily. I'll just add to that, Nick, as well, and I, everything everyone said, a massive plus one, like Spring, as you've said, Anna, Spring Boot has evolved over the years. It's very Kubernetes aware now, love my Spring Boot. But over the holidays, I was geeking out a little bit playing with Quarkus, so it's an, it was awesome, right? I was playing around with Quarkus, um, everything streamlined, the DevX is really nice in it. And the cool thing, like, and it is kind of cool, uh, is using Graal VM to compile native images. So you get very small binaries compared to what you're used to with, you know, JDK, or sorry, a JVM and a, uh, a JAR file, for example. And the startup time is unbelievable with Quarkus. That said, I've not run it in production. So I will caveat that. But like, if I was, I do sometimes bump into customers like, oh, the JVM is too heavy. Like I mentioned before, you know, it's getting um killed, whatever. We're going to learn Go. And I'm like, well, hey, maybe an interim step is to go something like Quarkus in that you can take most of your Java knowledge but the way you compile it's gonna be a bit different. The way you run it's a bit different. So again, I haven't run in production, played around with it, think it's super cool. I do think, and I sort of hear rumors that folks are doing this, but I've not really got many massive case studies I can point at. But I think if you are, you know, I definitely bumped into, even before Quarkus was a thing, I bumped into some folks saying, oh, Java's too heavy, I'm gonna learn Swift, I'm gonna learn Go. And is that really the most valuable thing you can do to your business or do with your business? probably like you said nick like taking your existing knowledge is probably a lot more valuable and a halfway step can be something like quarkus or micronaut mm -hmm. yeah i've seen uh, many teams in the past like uh, 12 any months they had decided to leave java because it wasn't fit for their current environment and they were developing some services in go and i'm 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 very happy that these new frameworks like Quarkus and Micronaut appeared because they gave these teams, these developers, a chance to keep using Java. Because that's not that's not my experience, but I heard at least from five different teams that after you use Java, like Java 8 at least, and you switch back to Go, it's like you move it like 10 years in the past, your, your development experience. And so they weren't that happy, but oh, Go is faster. Go has a smaller memory footprint. And then when they learned about these new Java frameworks, they were super excited because they were able to, to be productive again. They were able to reuse their existing skill because for Java, there is a library for everything. So they came back to being productive and yet uh, they could uh, reap the benefits of having a smaller memory footprint and, and being faster in production as well. Awesome, thanks guys. Okay, so another great question um, from Jim this time. So with all the cloud offerings of a Kubernetes platform, um, so things like AKS and EKS and GKE, could you share any advice about how to strike a balance between installing something like Redis yourself versus when, uh, using one of the highly high availability status deployments? 
is it wise to use HSI as possible or should you take on deployment yourself? I mean, from my experience, it probably depends how much, um, I suppose, time you have in terms of people time available to manage these things. Now, for us as an organisation, offloading that responsibility to the cloud provider to, you know, and use managed services where, where possible just makes a lot of business sense because we can then build the valuable things for us. Um, obviously, the data stores valuable, but it being available and operated and um, healthy is kind of really important and we're a small team we can't you know we can't find the capacity to kind of do you know manage everything ourselves so yeah I lean just maybe it's kind of unique to us but just definitely lean towards um SAS where possible yeah plus one nick like all the customers well that's not I must say all a lot of customers i work with um do rely on on um the clouds because typically they're invested in the cloud anyway so you know pick a cloud like they, they sort of like um you can use cloud specific technologies like dynamo db or cloud spanner these kind of things then you've got to be aware that you are buying into the cloud vendors abstraction so you know again i still think that's a good thing to do sometimes i, I wrote many uh, interfaces over my spring uh, time where i thought i would swap out the database you know I had my dao layer this mysql implementation i thought i was going to do a postgres implementation in 20 years of development i never swap to database i don't think right so uh, i think buying into abstractions is, is fine sometimes uh but where possible if using things like redis like totally i would push that onto the cloud um onto the cloud vendor i like you nick i haven't got time to look after to operate these things i think that, you know same argument with security right the cloud vendors can do it much better than i can and that's what you know i hear from customers uh, customers too um there is some unique use cases where you've got um really tight requirements around say governance um, uh, or, or um, provenance. Um, so I know I've worked with some companies in Switzerland and that they can't even have bits leaving the country. And um, so like they often um, go with um, like, a, I can't remember the name of the, it's like BT equivalent in, in, in Switzerland and British Telecom. Um, Swisscom. Swisscom, sorry, Swisscom. yeah, Swisscom, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like Swisscom guarantees that no data will ever leave like their network out of, out of Switzerland. And therefore like folks do run their own data stores on, you know, on um, Swisscom's hardware, these kind of things. So you always, gotta look, you know, there's always an exception to the rule um, and you've got to look at the requirements, but I think in general, I lean towards the SaaS offerings. Yeah, as well. Most Oh, sorry, go on. Please go ahead. I was going to say, I suppose, what I was going to say was um, an old SaaS offerings aren't kind of made equal. One something that we're always kind of cautious around is like, how can we integrate with that platform in an automated way? What's its API like for, you know, you know creating our new instances automatically by integrations that we build into our DevOps or CI, CD type processes. So that's kind of something to think about. It isn't just a case of going to a console and clicking a button. We want to know how we can integrate it into our platform um, as seamlessly as possible, essentially. Yeah, I'd like to point out that most SaaS offerings, they are cheaper to run as SaaS when you're small and they become super expensive when you're big. But on the other hand, if you're paying enough money, if you think it's too expensive, uh, this amount of money that you're paying to the SaaS offering, maybe this amount of money could be invested in your own team to be deploying that uh, on your own. Uh, and when you grow big, in the beginning, you don't have this problem. When you grow big, you might have these GDPR things, these issues that are popping up everywhere in the world that, well, I need to deploy this. Uh, so I need separate clusters to store customer data in Switzerland or in Brazil or in the US or in different states in the US or in Asia. So if you have this strict requirements, then then maybe you have to run on, on your own. But uh, again, uh, agreeing with almost everybody, I would start with the SaaS offering at least. And when you grow too big, then you reassess uh, what you have to do. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, so another great question um, from the audience. So this one's from Michael. So would you recommend Kubernetes for new startups? Would you use it yourself for a startup or wait until a later point? That is a loaded question if ever I've ever run, right? You get your camera going, yeah, Kubernetes for your startup, <laughs> uh, which is it's a, great, it's a great question. I'm, I'm being facetious. But, you know, it's, it's a really important question in that I have worked with a bunch of startups where I'm just like, just use um, Cloud Run 
just use what was it before um app engine or whatever like in google uh, just use heroku right as in if you've not got product market fit that's be the most important thing for your business and whatever is simplest to get product market fit is where you should go and kubernetes we can't really use the word simple with kubernetes being being candid even if you're you know using gke and stuff so like in a, just as a sensible answer to the question i would probably lean away from using kubernetes until i have product market fit but i'm sure as many folks would disagree with me My, um, I'll, I'll try disagreeing with you, um, just for fun. <laughs> um, I mean, it, and again, and, uh, and not a very effective disagreement, but if you've already got the Kubernetes skill, then, then you're not worrying about that kind of building that skill set whilst you're trying to work out what your product is. So it, it, you know, if it's already in your toolbox, then why wouldn't you? Um, you know, because you, you, if you're already living in that world, then that's just going to be the natural approach or a, a reasonable approach to take. Um, but if you, again, if, you, if you're having to build those Kubernetes skills alongside everything else, it probably makes less sense. Yeah, I'd say that unless you're a Kubernetes startup, maybe you shouldn't be using Kubernetes. Or if your product runs on top of Kubernetes, you shouldn't be using Kubernetes. And I made this point uh, with my son. My son is a freshman in a computer science course. And he had this his pet project and oh, and I want to deploy it in somewhere in the internet so people can access it. And I see that you you talk a lot about this Kubernetes thing. Should I learn this thing to, to deploy my app? And I said, how many months do you want to wait to deploy your application? So because if if you want to deploy like next week, uh, you're never going to be able to learn and deploy. And unless you can wait study and wait for six months. You should do something like Heroku, and I pointed him the web web page, and like two hours later, well, oh, that it's running. Yeah, yes. Well, that's the point of using a, a SaaS offering like Heroku. Awesome. Uh, so another question this time from Chris. Uh, so has anyone used IAC, so infrastructure as code, to manage a cluster, something like Terraform or CloudFormation? And if yes, what gotchas have you come across? So would you do it? What kind of war stories do you have about it? So I used Terraform, we, my team and I, used Terraform uh, when I was working for a consultancy called Open Credo. I'm sure folks might have bumped into Open Credo, still going strong in London. Um, and folks were actually asking us for, for um, manual installs effectively or uh, custom installs, I guess, of Kubernetes. And um, we would often say, you know, hey, we recommend using the, the cloud products. But this was a few years back and they weren't quite as robust as they are now. So, yes, we saw a whole bunch of folks. We, um, we used to teach, actually, if anyone's bumped into Kelsey Hightower, who's a legend in the space, we used to teach folks how to deploy Kubernetes using his Kubernetes the hard way tutorial, which is still online. And we basically terraformed that and we walked from, through how to do these things. But to Anna's point earlier on, one of the hardest things was keeping it up to date. Yeah, patching it as the API changed, um, particularly in the early days of Kubernetes, it was fraught with danger. And um, you almost wanted to do like a blue green type thing. You wanted to, you know, spin up a whole new cluster um, with Terraform move all or to redeploy all your applications onto that cluster and switch it over. You, you didn't want to be upgrading in situ, you know, even though Terraform completely supports that. And I've used Terraform to do that many times with a normal cloud kind of deployment. With Kubernetes, it was fraught with, with danger, I, I found. So yes, I, I mean, I, I'm a massive HashiCorp fan. You'll see me talk about HashiCorp all the time. Love Terraform. If you're actually um, using Terraform in your stack, you can use the Helm provider. And Nick's talked about Helm. So I use the Helm provider with some customers to actually manage apps on Kubernetes. Um, but in terms of spinning up your own Kubernetes, um, be careful of the operational burden, the maintenance burden going forward. Well, I also think that Terraform is a good tool to start, uh, you know, looking into making your own um, your own clusters and um, keeping it um, like for a start. It's, it's good for a start, I would say, but you must think it's the long in the long term. I mean, and also how big is your platform that you're actually building? Um, and because there's somebody who will have to look in, into that on the long term, as as, as Daniel said, like. You, they're going to be updates. It's inevitable. Um, you're going to want to do that. And you're going to think like, um, yeah, I need to evolve. So if you are starting and you're just starting with Kubernetes and you just want to build your own things and see, hey, how this works, I would definitely recommend for that. 
So in, in terms of gotchas, it, I think they're right now, there are even best practices with Terraform as well. I and mean, every tool nowadays has best practices. <laughs> There's no such thing as you don't find advice. It's amazing how much content it is available. And of course you have to trim a little bit and see what fits for your needs. But um, Google is still my best friend at some, at some <laughs> point. And Kubernetes.io. Don't, don't forget about that one. Um, I mean, I want to say this, the Kubernetes.io documentation is still a gem in terms of like remembering why that thing that you knew and that you worked for so much time with is still behaving in a peculiar way. And um, yeah, there was something in, that you misinterpreted and you've, or you forgot and the documentation helps you a lot in that, in that area. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, we have some Terraform, but it's quite minimal because of our GKE integration. You know, a lot of the kind of, I suppose, the lower level infrastructural concerns the communities are taken care of. But I'm, this is more of, I suppose, a question. Daniel mentioned um, the Helm provider. And what, what I suppose, what's the, do you feel the tipping point is between how much you would put into Terraform and not, because no, you meant, so I suppose when we're talking about Helm, we're talking about deploying applications. Are we talking about, platform applications or almost like consumer applications like development teams using Terraform. Is there a kind of a, I suppose a, a tipping point as to where you might stop? Yeah, good question, Nick. And I, I think the folks I see using the Helm provider have heavily invested in Terraform for other parts of their system. Like they often are building their own Kubernetes clusters with Terraform. They've definitely got a whole, um, to, to Edson's point, like legacy estate of VPCs in Amazon, for example. They're running a bunch of stuff on VMs. Uh, or they're even spinning up the machine learning services using Terraform. So like Terraform is their single source of truth, if you like. And the beauty of all the HashiCorp tools is the consistent workflow. Even though the standards change, the config changes, the workflow is consistent with Terraform. You know, Terraform plan, Terraform apply kind of thing. So I, I think, I'm not sure about a tipping point, but if you really invested in Terraform in your stack, um, sort of using the Helm provider as an example, takes away some of the other machinery you might need with Helm if you're running it. Like, I, I think you use Helm files, Nick. Like I see a bunch of folks using Helm files in addition to Helm. So like you can, with, with the Helm provider in Terraform, you can sort of get away from some of that stuff. But I think it, a lot of it depends on how much investment you've already got on, in the stack. Yeah, cool. Okay, I see the questions are flooding in. Uh, so let's jump on. Uh, so following on from what Nick was saying earlier about base images, do you create your own base images? Do you start from scratch? Do you do um, stuff that's out there? So from, from our perspective, we we use CentOS. So we, we go to the official CentOS image. We're actually going to be, I think we're making a decision around that after, after some recent use. So there's a bit of discussion going on about where we're going. I think we're going to think about moving towards Alpine. But essentially, we'll go for a trusted, um, you know, origin of the image we don't start from scratch um, and then there's just there's there's often some like for us there's some maybe some unique tool into what we need or some decisions that we want to bake into our base images that we we build out and we publish and so we'll go from CentOS then we'll have like a, a Java image we'll have a Node.js image we'll have a Python image and um, development teams just you know piggyback on that capability and build off those images and I think, it, it, I suppose it's, it is something to think about as an organization because you are exposing more of the, the detail to your developers and that is a choice we've made. And it, it can be challenging at times because there, are, there is that steep learning curve. And I think Daniel mentioned about things like build packs, they do abstract some of that complexity from you. Um, I think overall, it, I found that it's been okay, but it does come at a cost at, at times of the kind of, the education piece around making sure people understand how Docker files work, for example, to package their application. Um, but yeah, um, I think essentially, yeah, we don't go from right from scratch. We we go to the the community like of the distribution that we're using, and we'll trust them as a source. And uh, especially when you're working with a cloud provider, you kind of get um, like the good. Um, the good ones, the good images to, to start as a base. Um, but also uh, you can make your own base images. If for example, you deduce that 
uh, well, while you're working at certain points, and then not talking specifically to microservices right now, but there are situations when you would like to create your own base because you realize that on the official base, you added some things and that, that base repeats across uh, a, few, a, few, a, few, a few parts of your application. So you would like to make your own base. So that's another good practice. But the, you know what you should look into the, when you're building your own base, as, as you mentioned, Nick, is that um, you have to maintain it, have to look into that. Like you are the one who is going to update that base. Uh, you need to evolve it, it's not, it's not a given. On the other hand, the, the, these bases, these trusted bases give you the control that you are going to deploy all the time. You know what you were deploying there, you know what your runtime is, so you are safe, you're in a safe space. Uh, but you should like combine both, combine what is given and trust it, and of course make an, a good decision on that. Um, but also uh, make your own, if you see that it abstracts some of your work and it's, it's easier to, to make, your, make your own. Yeah, I think something we've found like, as well, like on top of kind of what you just said there, is that having a, I suppose, like a curated base image, it actually saves us a lot on network and um, disk. Because if you think about if everybody in our organization is using the same base CentOS base images, they're sharing that across all the nodes that the applications are getting deployed to. So there's a real kind of the, the Docker, in, Docker model with the layering and the image layers. We, we save a lot there. Whereas if everyone was left to their own devices to maybe do it in slightly different ways, um, it, it probably kind of, it just changes that dynamic somewhat. So we do get some additional benefits as well at deployment time in terms of the scale. So that's cool. I'll forward the advice that I received from the Red Hat Linux team, because I had this question, should I be creating the image? Does any image work anywhere? And the answer that I got from the kernel experts, because containers are a Linux abstraction, unless you're using Windows containers, but I don't think anybody does. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, always use the blasted image from your platform. And why is that? Because if you're running on RHEL, then use the, the RHEL, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux based image. If you're running on an, an EKS cluster, use the blast image provided by Amazon. And why is that? Because you always want to be in sync. Uh, uh, you, you always need to have in sync, at least the glibc version and the GCC version that were used to compile your kernel, or else you might have like very weird uh, bugs into production. And if you're using the blasted image, that's the case for Red Hat. I'm sure it's true for uh, some other distribution as well. Uh, whenever uh, we detect a security vulnerability in any of the libraries, use it to build your particular image. Uh, because it's a blasted image, we know, oh, this particular container image that is running into production is using a, a flawed uh, base image. So we can just replace the underlying, underlying base image and trigger a redeploy in Kubernetes in production. So if you have any zero day vulnerability, we can patch it on the fly without uh, having to ask everybody, oh, does anybody is using like this particular base image? If you do, you need to re trigger a redeploy with a new base image. So if you use the blasted image, you can do this automatically uh, by your provider. So it's uh, first, it's a stability thing. You have weird, bug, weird bugs when you don't use the Zex, uh, glibc and GCC version, and also because of security. And I was one of the guys that were constantly using Alpine and Scratch until somebody from the security team approached me. Yeah, you shouldn't be using this because of this and that. Okay, now I know. But if nobody had told me this before, I would still be using this. Well, well, but basically what everybody does. Yeah, um, so a bit of a contentless question from Jim. Is Kubernetes just a platform for running service mesh? Is Jim trolling? Or is that a secret? <laughs> I was thinking that too. Well played. So Jim and I are writing, and Matt is all writing a book together, and we are covering like service meshes. So we've been looking at them quite a bit at the moment. But yeah, I think like uh, service meshes have definitely got a, a use when you're like running at scale. But like many things, they come with additional complexity, additional abstractions. I guess that's what you were getting at, Jim, right? As in these days, everyone seems to be running Istio, everyone's running Linkerd. Um, console, I've, I've used quite a bit as well. And they do provide a lot of value, but again, it's more things to learn, right?
Uh, anyone else? No, cool. Um, I think maybe we have time for one last question. So I'm gonna pick one um, that I am interested in. So why is it not advisable to use uh, RD BMS containers like PostgreSQL in production, even when you have external volumes attached to store the data? But is it advisable? Would you use a PostgreSQL in a container in production? Or would you have it outside? I don't know if change it, but um, most database providers, they wouldn't support your database if it were running inside containers, much less Kubernetes. So that was the, the, the first point. Uh, it's not supported, so we can't run. But if you're, if you're using an open source database, if you're using PostgreSQL and you're not paying anybody for the support, so on your own, I would say that uh, uh, if you're relying on the Stack Overflow to solve your issues, you will be much more lucky to find uh, the solution to your problem if you're not running inside containers, neither Kubernetes. So I think that's the main reasons for not running. Uh, I know technically it's possible, but uh, if these are the downsides. Sounds a little bit like where we were once upon a time with, you know, Oracle would not support you if you're running on a VM kind of thing. Um, and most people got away with it. Most of the problems are reproducible on a physical machine. And I think, again, it depends on the database. You know, if you're running something like Postgres or Sybase, um, they work well with a separate storage thing. But again, Oracle historically, I mean, apart from the fact that you need a big chunky container, um, tends to have lots of integrated things where it puts stuff into the database and you can't, you don't have as clean a separation between your, your binary and your, your database, your, your external storage. While Postgres and, um, and Sybase, um, if anyone still runs Sybase, um, you know, they can run quite cleanly. You can patch or replace your, your, your binary Therefore, you can patch or replace your container fairly safely against your database when you're doing minor patches. Um, and I, I mean, I would, it feels to me like a great way of doing this for dev and test because you can run them in smaller environments. You can easily patch, you can easily move things forward. Um, but, you know, I do recognize that at the base of it, there is that problem of whether you're getting vendor support for that. And, you know, I, I, see, I see Postgres moving fairly fast towards that kind of support in the way that they want they want to make this work themselves. And they want to provide some of that interaction um, with, with the Kubernetes and with the Docker environment themselves. Um, I expect that the commercial vendors um, would rather you're running in their own special clouds. Okay, I'm gonna sneak in one last question. Uh, so any recommendations of team topologies that have worked well in organizations that have adopted Kubernetes? Alternatively, any war stories of things that have gone wrong? So apologies, everyone. I will have to bounce for a meeting now, but that's a perfect uh -huh. question to end because I've actually got my buddy's book, Team Topologies, <laughs> behind the <laughs> scenes. Right? Nick and I have talked about this. Matthew uh, Skelton, Manuel Pace. Fantastic. I see Duncan, you're reaching for it too. Yeah, this is your go-to reference. Yeah. Along with Accelerate and the DevOps Handbook, your go-to reference for, <laughs> for, uh, for all things Team Topologies. But thanks, everyone. Apologies, I've got to bounce. So Thank you, Daniel. See you later. See you later, Daniel. And yeah, I suppose from our traders perspective, we've decided, I think um, if I remember right, there's the platform team um, is one of the like, team dynamics or topologies that they describe. And that's essentially what we have at AutoTrader. We're, and I'm part of a, a team of software developers who are kind of interested in operations and have operational skills. And we're essentially an enabling team. So we, we're building software and tooling that enables other squads in the organization to be able to be effective and deliver on their, um, their goals and their um, objectives. Um, I know there's, there's quite a few topologies in the book and I can't remember them all properly, but I think platform team was one that I, when I read the book, that was something that resonated with me as to what we were doing. Um, so yeah, that's my experience with team topologies. So it feels like the general model that they're talking about in the book seems to fit whether you whether you configure yourself as a platform team or as an enabling team. Because um, the other two teams in the book is the stream aligned team, which is actually focused yeah. on the business functionality. 
um, and the specialist team. So if you need to have a team that, I don't know, understands statistics to the nth degree. So I guess we're just describing team topologies rather than finding <laughs> fault with it, which is perhaps a good thing to say about, about the book itself, is that it seems to be, it seems to support these kind of designs. Yeah, um, I think, sorry, go. Uh, so I want to add one thing. Uh, when the, I mean, if you're looking for a topology, yeah, you can find the, the recipe um, in, in the book and also what others have experienced. But uh, it's very difficult to apply topology to people. At least that's my point of view. Uh, you cannot go and find two human beings being the same. So it's very difficult to say like, hey, I need uh, this kind of person. I mean, you can, of course, make a team based on certain criteria. But it's, I find it very difficult to replicate, uh, you know, things on, on on people. At least you can replicate in Kubernetes. It's fine. You have replica sets and all that that works there. I mean, and pods and all that. But that that's something that's computer controlled, and that's something that you control as, as an engineer. But is um, and you, you should have actually look for look for controlling people. So if just the, you know, the topology is looking, is looked for, uh, yeah, probably um, the examples from the book would work, uh, most probably would work, uh, but you always have to look around to the people that you're working with and pay attention to uh, what their skills are and what they like to do. Otherwise, <laughs> you just stay with the theory and life is more than theory. Sorry, Nick, I interrupted you. <laughs> No, no, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It kind of reminds me of um, a few years ago when the Spotify model was kind of really popular and people just took that and thought that was the way, let's shoehorn it into our organisation and people will just become you know, productive and successful and happy. And I, yeah, I think you're right, the reality is that these things usually kind of evolve organically. And I think team topologies feels like, and I think it's based on case studies, so this is how organisations have evolved to work and have proven to be successful but yeah can you just go and follow that to the t and it work for you it's probably not that easy i don't think hey thanks everyone uh, so that's it that is our hour um so thanks everyone uh, thanks edson and duncan and anna and nick and daniel in his absence um it's been an amazing experience for me. I've gotten so much wisdom, so much learning. I have written so many notes of things to go and follow up. Uh, so thanks everyone. Also thanks to RecWorks for organizing it. And I believe this uh, there'll be a video posted at some point. So keep an eye out for that. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank Have you a know. great evening. Bye. <laughs>